Something I will occasionally discuss with an intrepid second passport seeker or someone who's building a diverse passport portfolio, as we call it, uh, is the idea of an uncorrelated passport, a citizenship in a country that perhaps is more neutral, where the passport is complementary to what they already have. Today, I'm going to share with you seven uncorrelated passports that you might not have thought about. Hi, I'm Andrew Henderson. I'm the author of this book, available on Amazon, and the founder of Nomad Capitalist, where we help seven and eight figure entrepreneurs and investors legally go where you're treated best. Those are the five magic words. More at nomadcapitalist.com. Let's talk about uncorrelated second passports. Now, there are numerous ways to get a second passport. We've talked about this in other episodes. Uh, one of the more common ways recently is citizenship by investment, and one of the most common ways to get citizenship by investment is the Caribbean. I think that's a great step. What the Caribbean citizenship by investment does is it gives you the freedom to give up most existing citizenships without losing a ton of travel privileges. It gives you, you know, tax stability, tax neutrality. It gives you a beautiful place to live. But what's a good possible next step or possibly even a good first step is having a passport that is uh, in a very neutral part of the world or it's a neutral country where they're kind of playing, you know, different alliances and where you're gonna get some different kind of travel privileges. Let me just give you an example. I'll start with where I'm sitting right now. The first uncorrelated passport is in Serbia. Now, if you look at the Serbian passport, it was one of the fastest improving passports in the 2010s in terms of adding visa-free countries. The 2010s were pretty good for a lot of the world. If you look at Russia, for example, they doubled the number of countries they got from 50 some to well over 100. Uh, in roughly that time. But Serbia did pretty darn well. And so what Serbia does is they're one of the only countries in the world now that has visa-free access to Russia, historical tie, to China now as they've opened up more with China and Chinese can come to Serbia. They have the visa-free travel to Europe's Schengen area so you can go to Europe. And so you're basically in between all three of those in addition to pretty good travel, uh, decent travel in Asia, countries like Japan, which are not easy to get, the opening up to the UAE, good throughout Latin America. It's a pretty good passport. Now, if you look at Serbia, you know, compared to a country even next door like Montenegro, which joined NATO, uh, which is talking about EU ascension, perhaps a little bit more seriously, Serbia has been, yeah, you know, we don't really want to join the EU. We're, you know, we still like Russia. We're opening ties with China. It's kind of like we're going in different directions. So if you're American or Canadian or Australian or something like that, and you were to become a Serbian citizen, you would add a reliable visa-free travel to Russia, to China, even to Iran. Um, and so you're getting something that, well, you've got a pretty good passport. You know, those are some of the big countries that you wouldn't have access to. I think Venezuela too, which Americans and, and some other Westerners don't have access. Are you looking to go to all those countries? Not necessarily. I do think that Russia is a place that more people should look at for certain lifestyle opportunities. Um, but you're getting something where it's not like a Montenegro where they, they're moving more in one direction. Serbia is its own entity. They are somewhat uh, you know, in the midst of that all. And so that gives you not only a certain kind of neutrality, it gives you a complementary passport that adds on. Um, it's a country that probably has a different landscape than where you're from. So it, it's very uncorrelated and it's very complementary in many ways. You could say similar things about Bosnia and Herzegovina next door where um, they have the same Russia, the same China. They've not been as good or as aggressive at pursuing perhaps due to their smaller size and, and being a little, little bit of a, you know, a little bit later in terms of time. They don't have as much of the visa-free travel, but it's a good passport and they're in this kind of similar situation. Is anyone saying that Bosnia is joining the EU or Bosnia is entirely with Russia? No, but they are opening up to different parts of the world. And so in the Balkans, outside of the European Union, which obviously has its benefits in terms of giving you excellent TRA passports, access to live all throughout you know, the European Union. There's certainly tax incentives in a number of EU countries now, but some people like the idea of just being outside of the EU, being in countries that have not quite as good a passport, but a good passport, are doing different things politically. And those are two that stand out to me in the Balkans. Now, how do you get those passports? It is more difficult. You can buy real estate, you can live there, you can get married to someone. Uh, that, those are going to be more difficult passports to obtain, but there's certainly two that I would keep my eye on if I was looking for uncorrelated passports. Not so far away is the small country of Armenia, which we've talked about before, which offers a path to citizenship for those who have any kind of Armenian ancestry. I've seen people who 
uh, weren't aware they had Armenian ancestry or weren't aware that it entitled them to citizenship, there is also the opportunity to go and live in Armenia for some period of time and become naturalized. Why Armenia? Well, Armenia is, unlike Georgia to the north, which we've also talked about a lot, Armenia still has more connections to Russia. They are increasingly, as they reduce corruption, getting closer with the European Union. But whereas Georgia is very much focused on the EU and NATO and all of that, uh, Armenia is, is staying a little bit more neutral. There are some reasons for that, but they are uh, staying you know, in a bit different kind of position. And what Armenia also offers that some of the other passports in this region don't is visa-free access to Russia, visa-free access to China, and to Iran. And so it's not a great passport at the level of a Serbia or even a Bosnia, but especially if you have a, a claim through descent, I think this is a great passport to get. First of all, what you're getting as a complimentary passport is you can renew your passport in a day. You can get a police record in a day. You can do certain things with power of attorney. And so if you are going to apply for a certain residence program where you only need to disclose legally one nationality and provide one set of documents, you know, if you're coming from a country where, whether it's Russia, which is a total pain, or even the U.S., which can be a pain for certain residence programs, you could say, hey, listen, I'm Armenian. Here's my Armenian documents. It'll take you no time at all to put that together. And in the meantime, you have a passport that really adds on to other passports. So again, a bit more difficult for some people to get, but one that stands out to me as being somewhat uncorrelated. Another one that's more on the radar of a lot of Westerners is Ecuador. Ecuador does not have access to Europe's Schengen area as a passport. That may be coming, as you've seen its neighbors like Colombia and Peru get access in the last uh, number of years. But Ecuador, again, Russia and China, uh, visa-free. Ecuador, one of the easiest countries to visit. It's a wide open country, it's a neutral country. Practically everybody except for like, Nigerians and two other nationalities can come to Ecuador. Now the challenge may be transiting through wherever you need to go to get to Ecuador. So they have that little bit of a trick up their sleeve. But uh, Ecuador, interesting place to live, a place that we've increasingly been looking at land in and investments in Ecuador, a country that I think perhaps now is, is moving in a better direction, especially than some of its neighbors like Peru. And so definitely a place for cheap land. If you're willing to commit to time on the ground, you can eventually work towards citizenship in just a, a handful of years. And so the fact that Ecuador is not as friendly with, let's say, the U.S., not nearly as friendly with the U.S., for example, as its neighbor Colombia is. Uh, nothing wrong with being friendly with the U.S., but if you're looking for something uncorrelated, you want a place that's more neutral. And you've seen Ecuador on the news over the years in terms of a place where you know, people might want to be going, people might want to be staying. They've been open to you know, letting people in. And so definitely, I think, an uncorrelated passport in South America. If I'm looking for a place to go and live and buy land, definitely it's a different lifestyle vibe in an Ecuador than, let's say, Colombia. Uh, the people, perhaps a little bit more um, suspicious of, of people coming into a lot of areas, not everywhere, but a lot of areas, especially if you're coming in and buying up a big chunk of land. Uh, I think there's maybe some things you want to deal with there. Uh, versus a Colombia, for example, or a Mexico. But as a political place to live, as a political citizenship, um, to differentiate your passport portfolio, I think it's a very interesting one to consider. Also, Bolivia, similar quality you know, passport. They've had historical ties with Russia. It's a country that probably, you know, in many ways, does not fit the nomad capitalist mold. Citizenship is not easy to obtain without living there. You do need to go there. That said, if you do live there, you can obtain it relatively quickly in just a couple of years. Um, there are people who go down to live in Bolivia, definitely a different kind of vibe, different kind of lifestyle, but the fact that they are, again, kind of detached, almost kind of you know, physically um, with the geography, but detached from a lot of the other associations that some of the countries down there have, makes it a very interesting kind of uncorrelated passport. In Asia, Cambodia is very interesting because what you've seen is you know, countries like Malaysia, which historically have had very good relations with the US. I once said that the, the Malaysia was the United States of Asia in just the good ways. But Malaysia has historically had a good relationship with the US. They are, as the US has dropped the ball in Southeast Asia, uh, increasingly looking towards China. But there's still, I think very Western looking because Malaysians have great passports. They, they go to the UK, they go to Europe. I mean, it's a much more international place. Singapore obviously being the same. Uh, if you look at other places in Southeast Asia, I think that they potentially are, are less neutral. I mean, Cambodia to me seems like a very uncorrelated passport. Now, we've talked about how you can get Cambodian citizenship 
in as little as three years through marriage if you happen to marry a Cambodian. There are ways, some more legit than others, and obviously I recommend only a legit way, of obtaining Cambodian citizenship if you make substantial investments there. There's a whole process for that, and we've talked over the years about how it is rather opaque. Uh, and so if you're looking to make substantial investments, uh, land compared to an Ecuador, for example, not really going to be that cheap. That is the downside of Asia. Its stuff just has become, thanks to China, much more expensive. I still see a lot of investment opportunities in Cambodia, and if I were a Cambodian citizen, that would give you certain access around Asia, which is generally rather difficult to get and give you an ASEAN passport. And I see that as one of the more uncorrelated passports in the region. Another one in the South Pacific is Vanuatu. And, you know, having spent time in Vanuatu, it's, it's very apparent. I mean, this is a country that likes the attention from China, uh, likes the attention from the West, you know, has visa free for its passport to Russia, for example. So there's some relationship there. Uh, they are, unlike some of the other countries in that region, you know, much more unaffiliated. If you look at some of the other uh, countries, I would say not so far away, but everything's far away down there. Um, they are uh, on their own. Now, Vanuatu has a citizenship by investment program, and I wish it were better managed. I wish it were less confusing. I wish they had done a much better job, and I told them that uh, about four years ago. And, you know, they've talked about making improvements. They've talked about streamlining. I, I'm still not quite there. Now, if I'm building a passport portfolio and I already have other passports that I'm using and I want to get Vanuatu as something just to add to the portfolio, that could be doable. As a first, second passport, I would not be doing Vanuatu in its current form. That said, there are opportunities to simply go and live there. The naturalization timeline isn't exactly short at 10 years, but it's not that difficult to get in if you want to put some time there. It is a tax-free country. It'll be interesting to see you know, how some of the new global tax changes will affect Vanuatu. But so far, um, while the country as a financial center doesn't exactly have the best reputation, they have resisted a number of things that have tried to come in. And so these are just thoughts about seven different uncorrelated passports that you could add to your portfolio. Some of them may be rather difficult to get. Some of them could be obtained through dissent. We have helped people uh, obtain citizenship in some of these countries because they have a parent from there, for example. Uh, some of them could be obtained by going and living there. Some of them, again, could be obtained by uh, some kind of investment. Um, but these are seven uncorrelated passports that I think, you know, hopefully put you in the frame of mind of if I get a Caribbean passport and that's my first, second passport, that's my plan B or even my plan A, that's a great start. If I need more passports to expand my travel options, expand my geopolitical options, give me more freedom, more flexibility, this is the concept that I would take a look at as a second step. Don't stop now. We've got well over a thousand more videos here on YouTube for you to watch and learn how to go where you're treated best. And if you want to work with Nomad Capitalist personally, go to nomadcapitalist.com apply, learn about our unique tried and true process, garner over years of experience, and learn how you can become our client.